Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we will start in a couple of minutes while we let our audience, uh, audience members settle in. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. We will begin in a few minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Diermeyer. I'm the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, over 1,700 uh, people registered for this event, and uh, we've received over 120 questions. We will uh, go through these questions as much as we can, and then for those of them uh, that we don't have time for, uh, we will follow up uh, and post uh, our answers on the Return to Our Campus website. Um, this is a uh, this is challenging times for all of us. And um, I'm particularly aware of the challenges that are associated with uh, dealing with a lot of uncertainty, changing situations, um, and a whole variety of questions that we all have. So our goal today is to focus on the medical concerns and then how we as a university are responding to these challenges as we're planning for return to campus. All our decisions have been driven by two principles. Number one, our core mission is to provide an empowering extraordinary education for our students. And secondly, to do it in an environment that is as safe as possible and that is guided by the best science and best public health expertise. We have been fortunate to have a fantastic, wonderful cooperative relationship with Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And of course, our own faculty and our own leadership has done a tremendous job over the last few months to prepare us. Having said that, there are many questions. And of course, this fall semester will be unlike any other that our university has ever experienced. We're committed to providing the excellent education that we're known for in an environment that requires all of us to adjust to an environment where health and safety have to be our top priorities. With that, I'm honored to introduce today's speakers and panelists. My co-host, Susan Venti, will moderate today's conversation. She's Vanderbilt's provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. 
We also have Dr. Jeffrey Balzer with us. He's the president and CEO of Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the Dean of the School of, Medic of Medicine. Also joining us today is Dr. William Schaffner. He's a professor of preventive medicine, health policy and infectious disease at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And many of you may have seen him already on CNN and other news outlets where he continues to educate the public about the clinical aspects and the science of COVID-19. We also have with us today, Linda Norman. Uh, she's the Valley Porter Manfrey Professor of Nursing and the Dean of Vanderbilt School of, Vanderbilt School of Nursing. Uh, Pam Jones is with us today. She's the Senior Associate Dean of Clinical and Community Partnerships for the School of Nursing and a fellow at the American Academy of Nursing. She will particularly focus on aspects such as testing, uh, contact tracing, and so forth. Uh, then we have with us today, uh, Dr. Andrew Churchill. Uh, he is a, a distinguished cardiologist and member of the medical school faculty, but he's also a vice chancellor for equity, diversity, inclusion at Vanderbilt University and chief diversity officer at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And finally, we have Eric Kopstein with us. Eric is the vice chancellor for administration at Vanderbilt University. Thank, thank you for all our panelists for participating today. And I will now hand it over to Dr. Balzer, who has been leading Vanderbilt University Medical Center through this global pandemic, Dr. Balzer. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, look forward to welcoming uh, all of you and your families to Vanderbilt this, uh, in, a, in a short time. Uh, my goal today is to give you a sense of how the Medical Center has been working closely with the university and our region um, as we've managed through the pandemic. And my takeaway for you is that um, this is a uh, among the various places your family could choose for college, this is one of the safer uh, locations. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center has been leading the care activities for not just this region in the country, but has been a leader in much of the nation's response uh, to this pandemic. I'll give you a few examples. Um, the infectious disease area is an historic area of leadership for the Vanderbilt Medical Center. And in fact, the people that know a whole lot about coronavirus, something that the rest of the world wasn't paying very much attention to for a long, long time, we actually have folks here that have worked on that virus for years. And there's a wonderful story, if you would like to look it up in the New York Times from uh, May 1st by the wonderful science editor, Gina Collada, about Dr. Mark Dennison, who's a member of the medical school faculty and was largely responsible for the preclinical testing that led to uh, remdesivir, which is now the major drug that is being used in hospitals to reduce length of hospital stay. And that kind of expertise has been very important to us as we've uh, dealt with the virus um, very early in the month of March. Um, the experts in coronavirus here were able to work with our pathology department to develop a test so that at a period of time where most cities uh, were unable to test, we were testing at very large volumes, up to a thousand people a day. And so the city government of Nashville and the mayor were able to see the impact of the virus very clearly, and we were able to respond. So while many places have been hotspots, um, Nashville has never been a hotspot, um, either, either in uh, the early part of March or even now where many places in the Southeast have struggled. Um, we are certainly seeing more cases uh, in, in the Nashville region. Um, and one of the reasons we believe that we are having uh, reasonably good control over the virus is because we have such excellent communication and close working relationship with the city and with the mayor. I talk with the mayor myself on a frequent basis and the head of the mayor's coronavirus task force is one of our physicians, Dr. Alex Jahanger, who leads our orthopedic trauma services. So that close connection is having a lot to do with the city's success. We played a major role in drafting the city's reopening plans. What we are using um, to titrate our response to the virus is close monitoring of the data and we use models. And you hear a lot about models in the news. The models we're using are very accurate and they just focus on our region. And so the quality of the data we can provide to the model is what makes it good. And we can be pretty accurate within you know, a month to six weeks 
um, in knowing what's going to happen. Right now, the Vanderbilt hospitals have about 38 patients um, in, with coronavirus. Um, just to give you a sense, back at the low ebb of the virus in May, we had probably 20, 25 patients. So uh, we're up, but not, um, not up an, at an alarming rate. And um, we basically are a facility with 1,400 beds. So as we look out a month or so, we see potentially having 70 or 80 patients in the hospital, but that's a very manageable number for us. And what we're also seeing is that the R0, which is that number that describes how many people are getting infected from each person that's getting infected in Nashville is around one to one and a half, one, sorry, one to 1.15, which is not as low a number as we'd like, but considerably lower than the rest of the states, the more rural areas of the states are much higher. And when you watch the evening news and you see the South East lit up in red, and you see Tennessee having high numbers, um, a substantial amount of that increase is not in Nashville. It's in areas that are more rural and are seeing much higher um, COVID transmission than we are. I think the other thing that's really helping us is the city responded on July 3rd before the holiday weekend, the city moved back to phase two from, a, from having been at phase three. The city has required masking of all of its citizens. And we're starting to see in our cell phone tracking data from our models a reduction uh, or, or an increase actually in social distancing, a reduction in movement, which tells us that we're getting out in front of this. So we haven't seen a rise in our, our zero values in more than a week. And we, we feel optimistic uh, about the future. So um, the last thing I would mention is Vanderbilt Medical Center is known for its um, expertise in caring for ICU patients and for patients with pneumonias. Um, and this has come into play for us because this, there are unfortunately some folks who end up in the ICU. What we see is that um, when people come to Vanderbilt and are sick, the death rates here are quite a bit lower than we've seen around the country. The um, incidence, the death incidence for people with coronavirus who are diagnosed in Nashville is well below 1%, um, which is considerably lower than the national numbers and even lower than the average Tennessee numbers that are running between two and 4%. So um, my bottom line would be, you know, nobody, nobody wishes we'd have, we have a, a pandemic on our hands in the middle of our, our children coming to college. But on the other hand, um, this is one of those places you probably do want to be if you're, um, if you're going to be away from home and away from family, because there are very few places have a, have a medical center this capable sitting right on the university campus that's all in and helping um, the faculty and the students respond in a, in a really excellent way. I think, Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Balzer. I think your, your comments are especially helpful given the fact that the students and family who are on and in this meeting with us today are spread across the entire United States and around the globe. And so thank you for giving them a, this really clear perspective on what those of us who are here in Nashville are seeing and experiencing. To our, our families and our students, I, I really do hope all of you are doing well, no matter where you might be. And I also want you to know that we are all looking forward to the start of the fall semester. With the close guidance of our panelists today and so many others here at Vanderbilt, we're working tirelessly to provide a meaningful educational experience for each of you, whether you are coming to campus or whether you have decided to study remotely for the coming semester. Now, with so many great healthcare experts on this panel, I don't want to delay. I want to jump in and have us um, address some of the questions, many of the questions that you have pre-submitted for this special webinar. So I'd like to start off with, um, in terms of addressing um, specifically how we're going to be testing our students, our, our undergraduate students specifically also, over the course of the semester. How frequently they, will they be tested? What is our approach for doing that? Our rationale behind our approach? And, and um, for that question, I think it'd be most appropriate to have Dean Norman and Associate Dean Jones address that because they have been 
um, from our School of Nursing um, helping spearhead this with our Student Health Center. Norman, you want me to? Go ahead. Um, we, we are planning to test uh, all undergraduate students before they come to campus. And we'll be mailing out test kits to the, the students that will do a nasal swab test. Um, there is a helpline that if anybody has any difficulty in being able to access it or, or need to have some help in uh, being able to administer the test, that they'll be there to do it. So why are we asking all undergraduates to have a pre-arrival test? And it's because we know that many, particularly younger people, may <clears throat> uh, have COVID, but they're asymptomatic. So we want to be able to, to test everyone and make sure that um, those who come to campus are negative. And that if someone is a positive, asymptomatic, that then they're able to stay at home until their healthcare provider has cleared them to be able to come to campus. But that way we're gonna to try to really decrease the, the spread of the coronavirus. So we're asking that for pre-arrival for those who are residential, as well as those who uh, are living off campus, because we know that our undergrads are the ones who are living, uh, some are living on campus, but they also have a lot of interaction with those undergraduate students through their classes and organizations that live off campus. All of our graduate professional students live off campus and that interaction is not as great with the residential students. So that is our pre-arrival testing strategy that we're doing to really try to help uh, get, decrease the amount of, of spread that we might have. So um, Pam, I, I'd like to, for you to tell us about the testing center uh, the students will have once they come on campus. Sure, uh, I'm happy to, because I know this is of, of great concern to our, our parents and students. And we've, we've stood up a testing center that will be in place once uh, students are on campus. And, and let me go through just a couple of components of that. First and foremost, testing for any individuals who are symptomatic, so students who have symptoms, will be readily available through the Student Health Center and our partnership with Vanderbilt University Medical Center. So that's the first line of testing. The secondary line of testing is what, what you know, we, for asymptomatic screening testing. And all undergraduates, as Dean Norman mentioned, will be tested before, and then they will be tested once they arrive to campus. We will be doing that over a period of time, no more than four weeks post-arrival, to get a feel for what's going on in the population after they have arrived on campus. And those tests will be the same kind of nasal tests. They'll be medically observed, and we've worked out a very well-refined process to get the students in and out and get those results turned around. There will be a team of nurses who, that I'm leading who will be monitoring those results and implementing contact tracing as appropriate. And I'll go into a little bit more about what contact tracing is. But essentially, we very quickly get anyone who's positive out of the general population into isolation or quarantine if they're a direct contact. So it's really a combined effort. And as Dr. Schaffner will address later, it's not just about testing. Testing is one piece of a multifaceted strategy that we have to try to create an environment with the least risk. Um, but testing is, I know, first and foremost on everybody's mind. So we wanted to be sure and address it. There's lots of more information on the website I, I wanna let you know you will be getting a communication that we will need back from you the address that you actually want the test mailed to. Uh, we heard loud and clear from people that getting testing in your own communities may be problematic. So we've come up with that solution to provide you with what you need. So please get back to us as soon as possible because you might not be at your main mailing address. You might be on vacation somewhere and want the test shipped there. So. 
Um, more to come on that. And again, the, the website is a great, a great um, information source for you. Well, thank you very much for that overview of the, the testing strategy for the undergraduate population. And I know that our graduate and professional student population will be, um, if they're symptomatic, will also be utilizing the, the student. Absolutely. And, and one other thing I didn't mention, uh, Provost Wint Winty, that I should have is we have designed this to be very flexible. So if we need to um, increase testing, we can do so. We've designed a facility that we're gonna leave stood up and we just have to add more people to do it. So as we use science and the best advice from our, our medical colleagues at the medical center, we can adjust that testing based on a broader sampling or whatever we choose to do. Um, so this is evolving quickly and we've built a system that's responsive to that. Okay, thank you so much. I know you also mentioned um, contact tracing and we've heard a lot about contact tracing and you know, the definitions of close contact. Um, would you expand upon that a bit? Sure. So this is an important concept to understand because we have all had a lot of anxiety about how, quick, how easy it is to get coronavirus. And I wanna just reiterate what the CDC says, which is being a true close contact to somebody who is positive means that you've been within six feet for 15 minutes or more. Um, so it's really not something that you pass somebody in the hallway and you're likely to get this virus. It is something, that's why the social distancing and wearing masks are so important and the de-densification that we've done on the campus are so important. So when somebody becomes positive, we quickly activate a team that we've put together of nurse practitioners um, who do detailed interviews with that individual to identify who their contacts were. We also use internal resources that we have. So for example, in some schools, we'll have somebody who's an expert in how they uh, manage their facilities that will help us also identify those close, close contacts. The contact tracers then get in touch with those close contacts, do additional interviews, including assessing how they're doing from a mental health standpoint and anxiety about this. It's an anxiety provoking thing. What resources do they need to be to be successful in quarantine and help put those resources in place. Um, so nurses will be doing that and we'll be managing that and we'll be watching it over time. We've built it so that we can do it very rapidly. Um, typically a health department has a lag time of several days um, and for a residential community in particular, you wanna be able to respond very quickly and get people isolated and quarantined. So that's the program that we've put in place and we have a high confidence level in it. We've already practiced this several times, um, both in simulation as well as real life experience. And um, we feel very good about what we can offer. Thank you. So it sounds like if a student is determined to be a close contact to a positive COVID-19 case, they're gonna hear directly from um, the organization that you've set up to work directly with students. Is that yes. right? Yes, and those are uh, nurse practitioners or nurses who have been specially trained in contact tracing, including in kind of the therapeutic communication, if you will, that is necessary, um, confidentiality, all of those pieces are, are, we've all been retrained in that. It's part of our training to begin with, but we've been retrained and, and we've got a, a leader who's supervising those activities. So it's very tightly managed. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize that when we look at our nurse contact tracers, that there will be daily or maybe more frequently um, nurse contact with a student who might be in isolation or quarantine, that they will have a contact with them and then be monitoring. And if the student's um, situation, if their health status changes, then we'll be able to very quickly get them to a higher level care if they need it. But we really are going to be attuned to what are the needs of the student while they're in quarantine, because we know that that's something once you take them out of their dorm and and have them in a separate location, that's that's a difficult time. So I'll just um, and this is a, a question that links also to um, how are you providing for off campus students. 
So the, the off-campus students, we'll still work with our, our colleagues and in students and, you know, dean of students and others. And the off-campus students will be not be provided on-campus isolation or quarantine housing, but they will be given the same type of support in terms of contact tracing, assessment of their ability to be successful in isolation or quarantine, and ongoing support. Um, so we will be offering that same high touch approach to off campus students as on campus. Great. Thank we, you so much. we know our on off campus students are not in the same density of living arrangement like a dorm would be for, that we would have for our on campus. So they would be able to stay in their home location. Right, exactly. But I'm really um, reassured by the fact that you're going to be providing them with the same, if you want to say, wellness checks and follow up to be sure that they're um, doing, doing well. And so I think we're just so incredibly fortunate to have such an outstanding School of Nursing to lead these efforts and work with us in terms of uh, providing the support to our community. So thank you so much for that. Now, since we've gotten some awareness of what the university's plan is in terms of handling um, this for our students, I want to really turn to um, Dr. Schaffner and ask you um, how you could help us better understand the impacts of this infectious disorder and, and help break some myths in regard to it. And, and some of those myths are, of course, surrounding masks and the impact of, of wearing masks and their effectiveness. Oh, just a minute. We got we to gotta demute you. <laughs> Okay, one minute, one minute, Dr. Schaffner. We are waiting for our, um, our host to uh, click on your voice for us. I'm giving them just a minute to do that. Okay, well, um, let's move on to the next question while they see if they can get your, or your, is your audio on now? No, it's still not on. Okay, um, you were definitely on when we started out the program. So we'll come back to that question, um, which means that I'm gonna um, pivot forward. Them? Oh wait, now we have you. Now hey. we have you, yay! There we go, there we go. <laughs> okay, well, I, I wanted to you to, to talk to us about you know breaking myths about this um, infectious disease and about effective preventive strategies to mitigate the spread. Sure. So uh, thank you, Susan, and uh, welcome everyone to Vanderbilt. Uh, we'll start with a little uh, piece of advice from a founding father of the United States, Benjamin Franklin, who, as you will recall, reminded us that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And as regards prevention, a fundamental aspect of prevention is wearing the mask. Uh, that's what the CDC says, as well as the American College Health Association. And it's certainly not only promoted, but it will be required whilst you're on the Vanderbilt campus and any other building that's associated with Vanderbilt. And as far as I'm concerned, I think every single person in the United States should leave their front door in the morning wearing their mask. That's how fundamental I think it is. Uh, so wh why should we all wear masks? I feel fine, why should I wear a mask? Once we realized that this was a really sneaky virus, this is a virus that could infect you, and although you feel completely healthy, hear me now, you feel completely healthy, you could be infected with the virus, and you're capable of transmitting the virus. And as you've just heard, transmission occurs most efficiently through close personal contact. Once public health became aware that totally asymptomatic, that is people without symptoms, could transmit this virus, then people such as myself, perfectly healthy, were asked to wear the mask. I wear the mask for two reasons to protect you so that I don't spread this virus to you. And the mask also provides some protection against incoming. In the event the virus wants to get into me, the mask will help 
fend it off. Uh, so masks should be worn on all occasions when you're close in with people. One of the things that I have seen, particularly young people, so bear with me, uh, try to do is go right out to the edge of those guidelines and we're figuring out where we don't have to wear masks. Please turn the coin or coin over. Wear the mask almost always, unless you're absolutely remote from anyone else. And even then, wear the mask because you show everybody else that you are with the program. Masks are effective. There's a lot of stuff on the internet just recently suggesting that masks could make you ill, that you don't get enough oxygen in, or you don't get the bad air out with the carbon dioxide. It's all nonsense. Don't pay attention to that. Masks are good. Masks will not make you ill. They're part of a program, a multi-layered program of everything we are doing in order to reduce the risk of transmission of this virus in order to prevent all of us from getting infection. Each one of those interventions, like a slice of Swiss cheese, has holes in it. Not one of them is totally perfect. And that's why we don't do a whole series of them. <clears throat> we do the testing part, the masks, the six foot distancing, avoiding group activities, all of those kinds of things, if we do them consistently, we will put together layers of protection that will assure our safety and yours also. So welcome to Vanderbilt. Pay attention to all those layers. It's a new normal, but it's important for all of us. This COVID virus <clears throat> likes groups. We are kind of a group activity in a university and a semi-enclosed community. In order to keep the COVID virus out, if we all do these things very consistently, we'll reduce the risk that the virus can sneak in among us. Thank you, thank you. Susan. No, thank you, Dr. Schaffner. That was really helpful. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, because of your emphasis on the use of masks and six foot distancing and, and staying um, away from crowded gatherings and crowded spaces about um, what it takes to get exposed. Ah, uh, yes. So what it takes to get exposed, we define exposure as within six feet, usually with, uh, uh, excuse me, within six feet of someone for at least 15 minutes, whether indoors or outdoors. It's not just passing someone in the corridor, anything like that. And so close contact means exactly that. It takes a little while for this virus to be transmitted from one person to another. And so the, the CDC defines close contact as within six feet for at least 15 minutes. You're all coming to college in part to enjoy a collegial environment but that collegial environment because of the COVID virus is going to have to be a little more distant than it once was. Sorry, it's the new normal, but if we all participate, we can make it as safe as possible. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Schaffner. And I know we also got questions you know, from students and from families, especially thinking that if per chance they should unfortunately um, contract COVID-19, that um, they've read about potential long-term effects, especially potentially heart or lung damage. Is there any correlation, Dr. Balzer, maybe you'd like to address this between the severity of the symptoms and the likelihood of long-term negative impacts? Yes, I'd be happy to address that. You know, one of the aspects of, of a worldwide uh, pandemic is that we uh, naturally have a lot of fears. And when people have uh, atypical, unusual um, side effects or consequences from having a virus like pandemic, like coronavirus, um, it gets reported. 
Um, and so what we hear is anecdotal reports of people having sustained damage to their lungs or having brain complications or heart complications. But truth be told, we know those things are quite unusual. And um, we don't have any solid evidence that there's a systematic long-term um, kind of complication from coronavirus that, that causes us to, to, to think that's a big part of this illness. It is an unusual illness, it's early days. We're still months away from knowing what for sure the long-term sequela of coronavirus are. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't guarantee that, but I don't think we know yet or certainly don't have strong evidence that there are long-term um, negative consequences that we can expect. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Balzer. I think linked to those um, physiological effects there are also um, concerns regarding the mental health and wellness of our students, um, re whether they um, unfortunately contract the illness or whether they are just um, balancing this new um, ways of living in a COVID-19 yeah. world. And, and so, you know, Dr. Churchwell, um, would you, you know, help address how we are going to potentially be helping our students who are struggling with the stress and the mental health concerns and in particular steps we're taking to help particularly students of color who might be more disproportionately impacted by um, this particular situation. Sure, Susan, glad to. You know, the death of John Lewis kind of magnifies the issues of race in America. Uh, sad to see him go as well as C.T. Vivian, great leaders. But it makes us think about the fact that we know that certain populations are more susceptible to this coronavirus. Particularly, we know African-Americans, Hispanic, Native Americans, also uh, Alaskans are much more susceptible. Tied to a number of things, there are three major factors going on there. We know that there's a chronic stress effect of being in const constantly worried in a, in a constant state of stress that can lead to a diminution in your immune response and raise your susceptibility to any infection, particularly a viral infection. We also know compounding that of the social determinants of health. Those are those things we know that are, that are important even, even before you reach the hospital that can affect your health care such as access to healthcare, such as poor nutrition and a host of other things, environmental. Lastly, compounding all of that are things tied to the comorbidities that African-American and Hispanic populations have in a much more preponderant manner. And that is the diabetes, hypertension, obesity. These things all summing together increase the likelihood of, of infections and particularly their infections from coronavirus. If you look at the data, these groups have higher rates of hospitalization, almost five times compared to their white counterparts. And if you look at the death rates, they can be based on the city up to twice compared to our white counterparts. So we definitely have to pay attention to this. And these are important things. From the standpoint of the mental health, I have to really hats off to GL Black, our assistant provost and deputy dean of students, who has really put together an amazing student care network. Uh, he has a student care coordinating team that are counselors and nurses that serve as a triage point. So a student comes in with a concern, they're able to triage that student to a number of services. If it's a medical issue, as we've talked about before, they go to the Student Health Center, which is connected to Vanderbilt University Medical Center and run by physicians. If they have a mental health concern or behavioral health concern, then they go to the University Counseling Center. And there we have at least 20 counselors. It, we're, it's run by a spectacular clinical, clinical psychologist and just recently, in the context of knowing that we have students of color coming back who are under additional stress, we've hired seven additional counselors, four African-American women, one Hispanic uh, uh, counselor, as well as an Asian-American counselor. So we're putting uh, time and money and, and, and um, people in to add additional resources there. I would also add, uh, I think that uh, our nursing colleagues have actually added an additional psychiatric nurse as part of the counseling to also support the mental health. So you can see we have put in place a number of things uh, anticipating uh, the concern that there may be more issues of mental health that are returning students both of color and also students uh, are also uh, majority students might have. So I, I think we've got things in place. We have a great team there, Susan. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Churchwell. I really appreciate hearing that additional information and those really important updates. I know that one way we often talk about helping our students with their, their mental health and well-being is in terms of exercise and um, having outdoor experiences to help help them balance and, and, and gain um, some 
release and, and opportunities for stress management. So um, I'd like to ask uh, Vice Chancellor Kopstein in terms of a question that we got, and that is whether or not students will have access to different recreational facilities or other exercise opportunities for this fall semester. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Susan, and thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, the short answer to that question about the rec center and other facilities at this point is that I sincerely hope so. And that's exactly what we're working towards accomplishing. We certainly recognize the importance of stress management and the role exercise can play as a means to address and to reduce stress. Um, the Recreation Wellness Center, however, is going to have to implement a host of programming changes in order to manage the situation that's brought on by the global pandemic and to really ensure the health and safety of the Vanderbilt community. Also, as we've talked about in some of our previous town halls, and you heard today from our School of Nursing colleagues, we're going to utilize parts of the Recreation Center to support our on-campus testing mm -hmm. In time though, it's really our hope to bring back as many of our in-person programs to full capacity at the rec center just as soon as we can. And those plans and decisions as with all others at this time are going to have to be informed and will be informed by public health guidance, the expertise of our medical center and also our school of nursing. Um, I can also tell you we have various colleagues um, in the organization who are working with student leaders right now uh, to provide input on plans for the rec center and they're also focusing on how best to safely utilize our outdoor spaces for recreational and workout purposes. Um, you've heard a lot from others on this call about just how critical it is to wear face masks and it is very critical to wear face masks at all times, even when outdoors. However, I'll say there are just a few exceptions around wearing face masks, one of which acknowledges the importance of vigorous physical activity. For example, face masks do not need to be worn while engaged in vigorous outdoor recreation. So think biking or running, as long as physical distancing is maintained at all times, including with people you're encountering walking on campus paths, on sidewalks and plazas. So we really are committed to the physical and mental well-being of our community. And we'll have more information as we move forward on the Recreation Center and other opportunities in that regard. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor Kopstein. Um, I now wanna to turn to um, a question that was put in and that was how will parents be notified if their child tests positive? And how will parents be kept informed about their child's health after they test positive? So that's a, a really good question. Um, we have federal uh, regulations that, that govern what can be shared with parents. Um, and, and so essentially parents will not be notified unless the student gives permission for that parent to be notified, unless of course they're a minor. And then that's a different situation. Um, but we're happy to work in collaboration as much as the student is comfortable with uh, working with to decrease the anxiety of the family unit, if you will. Um, it's, but we have to be consistent with the regulatory requirements that we have. Okay, that's very understandable and it really um, follows the policies that we've followed even before COVID-19 in terms yes. of um, parents and their students' health records. So um, we encourage you to think about that um, before your student arrives on campus so that you have things set up in the way that is best for your family in your particular situation. Okay, very good. So um, I, I'm gonna add a question in here um, because we did get some questions about this and we, we um, have extra time to add these additional questions. Um, one, this question is in regard to the virus's relationship to physical surfaces and the transmission through physical surfaces, surfaces and what this means for Vanderbilt sanitation processes and cleaning of physical spaces, be that classrooms or residential areas or public areas. Now I can see this question being handled by a couple different people, um, but I, I will let, um, I know in terms of just the, the virus's physical relationship to surfaces, 
um, perhaps we could ask Dr. Schaffner and Deans Norman and Jones to address that first. Oh, thanks, Susan. Yes, the virus can land on physical services. And that's why we're having a large disinfection program out there. Interestingly enough, the more we've learned about this virus and how it's transmitted, as the CDC says, physical services, uh, surfaces have receded in importance as a means of transmitting the virus from one person to another. It's not zero, but it's not nearly as important as that close personal contact. And indeed, the vehicle whereby the virus on the physical surface gets to me are my hands. And so rather than paying, you know, obsessing about physical services, we ought to pay a lot of attention on good hand hygiene frequently throughout the day. Soap and water works, so do the hand hygiene gels. That said, as uh, perhaps Eric can tell us, the physical surfaces in and around Vanderbilt are getting a lot of disinfection attention also. Very good, and thank you. Yeah, I'll just really quickly, you're absolutely right, Dr. Schaffner, and thank you for those comments. Just to be a little bit more specific, we'll be disinfecting the uh, high touch areas, which include all academic buildings, elevators, places where uh, there's a frequency of people at least twice per day and classrooms themselves will be you know, disinfected uh, every day. Disinfecting wipes are gonna be widely available and provided in classrooms for um, the occupants. And we are acutely aware of all the CDC guidance on cleaning and the appropriate types of chemicals and materials to use that will not only enhance the ability to remove the virus should it be in, on any physical surfaces, but also uh, provide a safe as possible environment for our occupants of those spaces. And, and Provost Wente, let me just add that part of the contact tracing function is also to identify where that individual who's positive has been on campus. And there's a very tight relationship with the environment and health and safety. So the clinical arm goes one way and the cleaning arm goes another and they get turned on simultaneously and we qu quickly go in and clean as appropriate based on the CDC guidelines. Yes, exactly. And that's across any, any space, be it classroom space, research space, residential space, or other public spaces for a, a confirmed positive case. So as Dr. Schaffner talked about new normal, that um, we're gonna try, try to stay six feet apart, as well as um, wearing our mask, we're gonna have to figure out a new way of social interaction because we tend to be a very touchy group when it comes to social interaction. We wanna shake hands, we wanna hug, we want to be close to each other. So <clears throat> I look forward to the new ways that our students are gonna show us of how to be able to socially engage, but without having to touch or to be keeping our six feet apart. Yes, and that's also another project that we have a team of students working on. We're getting great support through the Wandry, our innovation um, center, and um, we have student groups who have volunteered to help create solutions, not only in terms of how our outdoor spaces and exercise spaces are being utilized, but also in terms of giving our student organizations lots of ideas about how um, to build community. And I know some of our upcoming webinars for students and families are specifically focused on these really critical community building aspects of um, how campus will be in the fall. I'm going to turn to one final medical based question here. And that is, um, Dr. Schaffner, would you be willing to explain to us how COVID-19 is different from the flu? And could public health information related to COVID-19 also be an opportunity to include flu shots and why that might be important right now. Ooh, a wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Susan. Sure. Uh, both flu and COVID are respiratory infections. They involve the, uh, the lungs and the, the, the back of the throat and the nose. They're spread in entirely similar ways. And unfortunately for we clinicians trying to figure things out in the fall when flu returns, the two COVID 
and flu can present clinically in a virtually identical fashion. So we'll be doing a lot of testing to try to keep things separate. Uh, one of the ways that uh, flu and, uh, and COVID are different, noticed from the beginning when the epidemic in Wuhan, China was being observed, is that children and young adults are much less severely affected. There still is not a clear answer for that. For example, in influenza, we know that uh, the, uh, the flu viruses love young children. They have the, as I say, the distribution franchise in our communities. They shed a lot of virus, much more than adults, and for a longer period of time, which means they are little two-legged transmitters. They transmit it amongst themselves, bring it home to their parents and their grandparents and Aunt Susie who has diabetes, and it's those people who may get more severely ill. We're still studying COVID and children. We know that children sometimes become ill, but much less frequently than adults. We don't know whether they get infected frequently or they reject that infection. And we don't know whether they are big transmitters yet. That's all being studied, including by faculty right here at Vanderbilt, among other places. So the two are different, but this is an opportunity to mention flu shots, flu vaccine. Come the fall, this is one respiratory infection that we can do something about. We can get vaccinated. The recommendations couldn't be simpler. If you're older than six months of age, that's everyone listening, you should be vaccinated each and every year. I know it's not a perfect vaccine. Of course not. It's not a perfect vaccine, but it is a good vaccine. It prevents much disease and the disease it doesn't prevent completely, it makes milder. You're less likely to need medical care, less likely to be hospitalized, go to the intensive care unit, and you're less likely to die. Sounds pretty good to me. So I would urge all the parents and the parents to get the students to accept the vaccine once it is available starting in September and October. You'll protect yourself, you'll protect people around you, and you'll take some of the stress off the healthcare system because this fall, we're likely to have a double-barreled respiratory virus season, flu, and COVID. So let's do what we can with the material we have at hand, a pretty good vaccine. I like to quote Voltaire or paraphrase Voltaire, I should say. He admonished us, waiting for perfection is the great enemy of the current good. We have a pretty good vaccine that still can do a lot of good. Let's all use it. Well, I promise you, Dr. Schaffner, I will get my flu shot. Okay? <laughs> I <laughs> promise you, you will get the flu shot. <laughs> So um, I'm going to take us now to the last question before we close this out, and that is um, because we're near the end of our time together, and I'd like to um, kind of uh, focus us on the future, have us be thinking about uh, farther than a month, a month or two uh, in the future. And I'm wondering if Dr. Balzer and Dr. Schaffner could offer some comments on what they think regarding the future of the pandemic in terms of its duration, its ongoing impact, and how our actions and accountability as a community could potentially have an impact on this future. Well, um, I'll just uh, mention that <clears throat> you know many of us have high hopes for a vaccine over the coming months, and Vanderbilt is playing a leading role in that effort as well. Um, the publication that was just released in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that the NIH Moderna vaccine and healthy volunteers does create an immune response. And that testing, um, uh, much of it was actually done at the medical center here. Um, we will there then be a major site for the phase three testing that's about to launch in a few months. That said, that phase three testing is going to require 30,000 people. And think about how long it's gonna to take to not only vaccinate that number of volunteers, but then see whether or not having the vaccine makes a difference in whether they get COVID. It's gonna take months, if not years, to know whether the vaccine works, whether we actually need boosters. So <clears throat> I think the best attitude at this point is um, to hope for the best, 
but to prepare for the worst. And the worst is that we may have this for quite some period of time and number of years. And the things that we've all been talking about today and that Dr. Schaffner is certainly um, helping, helping us get our heads around in terms of how we need to live with this virus are the most important things to do. So I would reinforce everything that uh, Dr. Balzer has said. I've called it the new normal and the new normal it is rather indefinitely. Uh, masks will be fashion forward, going forward, not just for a little time, but for the foreseeable future. And if we all work together in order to reduce the spread of this virus to, as they say, flatten the curve, we can, as Dr. Balzer says, live with this virus, cope with it, keep its damage to a minimum, while all of us hope for an effective and safe vaccine, but that's a way down the road. The here and now is we need to be cautious and we need to be careful for ourselves and for each other. Well, thank you very much. And, and thank you to all of our panelists for this incredible um, summary and guidance and information. And I'd like to, to turn it over to Chancellor Deermeyer for any final comments. Thank you, Provost Venti. So first, I want to thank the panelists for their insights and for their commitment, and most importantly, for the tremendous work that they and everyone of the Vanderbilt community has, uh, has dedicated themselves to over the last weeks and months and continues to do so. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today, our parents and our students. Uh, these are challenging times, um, but we are committed to what we've always been committed to, which is to provide an empowering and excellent education. But we have to do it in an environment that requires us to adapt, to be more careful, and to put the health and safety um, of our students, faculty, and staff first. As you've seen, there's a tremendous amount of expertise um, here at Vanderbilt and at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, from the basic understanding of the biology of the virus um, all the way down to the clinical care, to how we're thinking about testing, how we're thinking about contact tracing, how we're responding to that. Uh, it is an enormous amount um, of expertise that we are fortunate to bring to the table. But we have to be continue to be smart about it. We have to continue to adjust. We have to be able to be guided by the best science and public health guidelines of, of the day, and we will do so. Our plans are thoughtful, they're careful, and they're flexible so that we can adjust as facts and situations on the ground change. But You've heard it from Dr. Schaffner, you've heard it from Dr. Balzer, you've heard it from Dr. Churchill, you've heard it from everyone on the panel. It requires everyone of us to step up. Uh, Vanderbilt is known as a place that educates leaders for tomorrow. And that also means for all of us is to embrace that responsibility fully. Our motto is anchor down, step up, and we mean it. That in order for us, to be able to deal with the challenges that COVID-19 presents to us. We all have to do this together as a community. We have to utilize the ingenuity, the creativity that our students have demonstrated so many times now and apply it to a new environment. I know we can do this as a community. We all look welcome. We all look forward to welcome you back in the fall. Thank you very much and anchor down. That was great. Thank you so much.